I also want to welcome you to San Francisco. Joe referred to me as being a Northern California guy and a Bay Area guy. I'm really a San Francisco guy. This is the place of my birth. This is where I went to uh, school, the University of San Francisco, and it's the place where I started my uh, teaching career. So uh, again, welcome to San Francisco. There is one question I'd like to ask before I begin speaking today. Would you please raise your hand? I've got lights in it. Maybe I can see better this way. Would you please raise your hand if you've never heard me speak before? Okay, there's quite a few of you. I'm always happy about that because I tend to repeat myself sometimes. Now, if you're sitting next to somebody who did not raise his or her hand, uh, they didn't understand me the first time they heard me, and they decided to come back and see if I would speak a little more clearly this time. So uh, anyway, in education, we call that reinforcement. So you will probably hear some things that you have uh, heard before. <clears throat> One other thing Joe mentioned was that I... Uh, was a teacher for more than 30 years. Okay, the exact number actually is uh, 36 years. And I, uh, my tour of duty started, I suspect, before a lot of you were born. Would you raise your hand if you were born over, after 1965? Okay, a lot of you. That was my first year of teaching here at Washington High School in, uh, in San Francisco. So my tour of duty went from uh, 1965 to not so long ago, 2001. So after 36 years in a public high school classroom, I've been in recovery now for 10 years. <laughs> and uh, the nice thing about the recovery is that I get to do this. Uh, I loved teaching, absolutely loved it. And I learned a lot as I went through my career. And for the last 10 years, I've had the opportunity to share those things I learned with, uh, with other teachers. Now, you heard that I was a high school teacher. I want to make sure those of you, and I know there are many, who teach K to, uh, K to 6. Uh, do I have anything for <clears throat> people in that, that that teach those age kids? And I just want to tell you a very brief story about my first experience teaching, um, speaking to teachers who taught younger kids than me. When I started off, I was speaking mostly to high school, teacher, uh, high school teachers and junior high teachers. But I was back in Cortland, New York, where my friend Tom Lacona runs the Center for the Fourth and Fifth R's at his university in, uh, near, near Syracuse in Cortland, New York. And he asked me at their summer institute to do an all-day workshop uh, with high school teachers. And I said, oh, I'd love to do that. I'm never rushed. I can have a lot of handouts and all of that type of thing. And, and um, we were having a, a ball. And we broke for lunch. <clears throat> and one of the young teachers in the audience came to me and she said, Hal, said, I have a friend here, she's a third grade teacher, she's in another workshop, she's not getting anything out of the workshop. And I told her that if, that if uh, she would come to the rest of my workshop, uh, that I think you'll get a lot of ideas, even though he's teaching high school, that you'll get a lot of ideas for elementary school kids. So she did, and she asked if it was okay, and I said, yes, it's fine, we have a few extra seats. And so I finished the afternoon, and... Uh, this uh, young teacher, her name was Robin Janae, and she came up and she thanked me. And I said, well, the big question is, I said, did you get anything that you could use in your own classroom? And she said, oh, my goodness. She said, I, uh, she said, we just got out of school two weeks ago. This was in June. And she said, I can't wait for school to start so I can go back and try some of these things. And I said, would you do me a favor? I said, after you get back into school and you get into your routine and you start doing some of these things, would you give me some feedback? And so I gave her my business card and she had my address. And, and I spoke quite a bit that summer. I was still teaching then. I went back to my own school. The crush of September comes, and I came home late in September, and there was a, a big packet uh, in my mail. And uh, it looked like this, and what it says on it is good news, kind words, I'm thankful for, and funny things. And I'm gonna talk about this later was one of the little uh, techniques that, that I used to produce a good atmosphere in my classroom. And what she did was she put a post-it note on the front and it said, Dear Hal, thank you again for letting me sit in on your workshop. Here's the feedback that you asked for. Well, I opened up the packet and she did a wonderful thing. The, all of the feedback came from her students. They were all third grade students. They write really interesting uh, letters. I don't know if you can see that or not, but stick figures and hearts and squiggly lines and all of that kind of stuff. And she knows I have a sense of humor and I think she picked this letter go on top on purpose. 
This little boy in her third period class, her third grade class said, Dear Mr. Urban, your conference in New York must have been really great. I don't know what you did with Miss Janae, but she sure came back in a good mood. So <laughs> I'll talk about that type of humor uh, later. Okay, let's uh, move on because I, uh, I am on a, on a clock. All right. The title of my presentation today is Lessons from the Classroom. Now, what I want you to understand is that these are not lessons the students learn. These are the lessons that the teachers learn. Uh, what did I learn during 36 years in the, uh, in the classroom? So it comes from, uh, you know, Joe had mentioned my books, and it comes from my most recent book, which I wrote for classroom teachers. It's called Lessons from the Classroom, 20 Things Good Teachers Do. I don't have time in this short presentation to cover all 20, but we're going to cover uh, we're going to cover a few of them. Okay, now, I think those of us who have been teaching for a while, we sometimes ask ourselves the question, what do our students remember? And, uh, I, you know, I was a social studies teacher, and so I wrote down some things that I remember teaching them, and they were kind of fascinated by, and, uh, you know, years and years of academic teaching, what, what do they remember? And so I threw up just five at random. I threw up five questions here. I don't know if anybody in the room uh, can answer all five of them or not, but I wondered if they remembered any of these, these things, or like where it says the youngest president. I used to give them biographical sketches of every president that we, we ever had and told stories about them, and so I figured they'd, some of the stuff would be academic that they would remember. B by the way, if you are curious about these, I will give you the answers. Uh, the, the capital of Nigeria is Abuja. Uh, that was a new one on me. It was Lagos when I was teaching, but it's Abuja. Now the population of India is uh, 1 billion 155 million. The youngest president was Theodore Roosevelt. He was 42 on the year, uh, the, the year he became president. The number of members of Congress is 535, and the main author of the Constitution is James Madison. Okay, but let's go on to the things my kids remembered. Okay, uh, Becky and I talked last summer in preparing for this uh, presentation. And I said, you know, Becky, I said, I can't cover all 20 things, so what I'd like to do is uh, talk about five of them, but I'm going to do it from my students' perspective, not from my own perspective. I have, I'm very blessed, I have contact with uh, hundreds and hundreds of former students. I had 9,000 students in my career, and through the magic of email and the internet and so on, I've reconnected with many of them, some of them going all the way back to the mid-1960s, and I had dinner just two nights ago with a student that I taught in my last year, 2001. And so I did a survey with them. I, I, there was about 100 of them that I picked kind of randomly, and I said, let's do this by email. It gives you a chance to think about the answer. So the, the question was, what are five things you remember the most from being a student in my class? And then I asked each one of them to begin each sentence the same way with the words, I remember. Okay, so the subtitle of my presentation today is Five Things My Students Still Remember. And I literally had contact with uh, uh, one of the, my students who graduated in uh, 1967, and she's in her 60s now. Okay, so I don't know how it's possible. Some of my students are older than I am now, but anyway. Uh, five things my students still remember. Here's number one. Now, I use their wording, even though they all came up with different sentences, but this girl... Uh, not a girl, actually, she's a full-grown full woman. Um, she said, I remember that I always felt welcome, that I counted, and that everyone was polite. That means everyone in my class. And I was so pleased to read that and many other comments that were similar. And she actually hit upon three things that I did very early in the school year, and I'll share them briefly with you. Uh, the three most important things I ever did as a teacher, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart, these were the three most important things I ever did because they set the tone for everything else. Okay, lesson number four in the book is good teachers start teaching at the door. That does not mean good teachers start lecturing or giving handouts at the door. It means something different. Uh, this is something I learned in 1965 when I was working on my teaching credential. Uh, it was presented to me as an educational proverb. If you can reach them, you can teach them. And I was uh, interviewed not too long ago, and someone asked me, what do you think your greatest strength was as a teacher? And I said, uh, there's not even a second place. My greatest strength was, was the, the ability that I developed after long, hard work uh, to connect with kids. 
If you can reach him, you can teach him. And I always took that to heart. And when it says teachers start teaching at the door, it means something very simple. I stood in my doorway. And every time a student came down the hallway, keep in mind the average high school teacher teaches five classes a day, I individually welcomed every one of my students every day, every period, the same way that I would welcome a friend into my home. And many of them said that that was the most important thing because uh, I had personal contact with them every day. And I write very clearly in the book, this is the most, the most important, the most fun, um, and the most energizing thing that, that I ever did. Now, one of the things that I was also doing while I was greeting them every day at the door is that I was teaching social skills. I told the kids on the first day of school, I said, I teach three things. I said, I teach academic lessons, and I will hold you to high standards. I said, but I also teach life lessons, and every time there's an opportunity to teach a life lesson, I said, I will teach that to you. I said, and I also teach social skills, which kind of fit in with life lessons. Now, you, this probably won't surprise you. On the first day of school, when I greeted the kids out at the door, very few of them did these, uh, did these things. Um, very few of them made eye contact with me because they looked at the floor. Very few of them smiled, again, because they were looking at the floor. They, when I asked them, I said, hello, I'm Mr. Urban, may I have your name? They mumbled their name, and then I reached out to give them a handshake, and they gave me something that felt like a dead fish. Okay, so on the first day of school, I got them in, and I said, Let, let's talk about uh, social skills that you really need to have in life. And I said, I'm not putting anybody down. I'm not criticizing anybody. I said, I just want to help you. And I said, I greeted you and, and explained what I got. And I said, now I'm going to be there every day. And I said, I'm sorry if I threw you off guard today, but you know I'm going to be there tomorrow. And I said, so here are the things that I'd really like you to work on. I said, not just with me, but with every person you come into contact. Make eye contact, smile, speak clearly, and give a firm handshake. They did marvelously. And then you're reinforcing it. Every single day that they come, and they're friendly, and they get to know me, and I get to know them, and it has a buildup effect. And I can't imagine ever starting a class not doing that. OK, now, after about three weeks, I made one change. Three basic requirements. They now know me. They've now been greeted 15 or 20 times. And I said, OK, we're just going to make one change. And it doesn't have to be a change if you don't want it to. There are three minimum requirements, eye contact, a smile, and speak clearly. I said, but I noticed that you guys greet each other in much more informal ways than a formal handshake. I said, now, if you are comfortable continuing to give me a handshake, that's fine, because you give me a good, firm handshake that has some meaning. I said, but, uh, but I want to give you an option. I said, you choose how you want to greet me, the physical part of the greeting, and I will respond the same way you greet me. Now, what do the kids do when they greet each other? They high five, they low five, they go like this, uh, they go up and bang each other like this. A lot of them uh, hug each other uh, and all those kinds of things. And I says, you can greet me any way you want. Well, the first time I ever tried that, I was just absolutely thrilled because they came down the hallway, they had more energy than ever. They thought it was pretty cool that they could greet their teacher any way they wanted to. And um, I had about 150 kids, and at least half of them gave me a hug that day. And it made me feel so good, because it made me feel they liked me enough to do that. They trusted me enough to do that. I did learn a long time ago, some of those kids said that was the only hug they got all day, which is kind of a sad commentary on what's going on in many families in the United States today. But anyway, that's, um, uh, that's what I did for the rest of my career. Some people have asked me, did you ever get any complaints about it? And I said, I literally mean this. I never got a single complaint from anybody. In fact, on back to school night, uh, parents would come and I would meet them at the door and they would say, do we get a hug? And I said, you, you, you do if you want one. It's a great way to meet people. Okay, and I explain in the book, this is not for everybody under all circumstances, but it is what I did and I loved it and it was very energizing. <clears throat> okay, now the other thing that the girl touched upon, she said, I remember that everyone was polite. Well. I have a chapter that says, Good Teachers Teach Manners and the Golden Rule. This has a little bit different history. I started greeting the kids at the door my second year of teaching. But I didn't start teaching manners until the early 1980s. I made a switch from one school to another within the same district. And the culture was very different there. And we had begun to see, uh, see a change in times. OK, Horace Mann, the father of public education in the United States, said manners easily and rapidly mature into morals. 
Would you agree with me that manners and morals have declined since the 1980s? Okay, we, that's something we're all dealing with. That's one of the reasons that we have character education. Okay, here's an indication of it. Not too many years ago, US News and World Report did a cover story called In Your Face, Whatever Happened to Good Manners? And Time Magazine did a cover story called Dirty Words, America's Foul Mouth Pop Culture. It is a different world that we live in today. Again, that's why we have character education. Okay, now, sometimes I ask this question, do kids do rude things? And people answer, well, duh. Okay, yeah, the answer is yes, they do. Whether they're in kindergarten or whether they're in their fourth year of college, kids do rude things. That's not the question teachers need to ask. This is the question that teachers need to ask. Do they know they're being rude? And my guess, and most people seem to agree with me, that between 90 and 95% of the time when kids are rude, they don't even know that they're being rude. Why? Because they're doing what they see on TV, they're doing what they see in the movies, uh, on the internet, and what their friends are doing. And they're unaware that they're rude. Okay, now, remember, I go way back. In the mid-1960s is when I started teaching how things used to be and how they are today. 1960s and 70s, if a student needed something from me, uh, he or she would uh, r raise the hand and say in a very pleasant tone of voice, Mr. Urban, may I please have? Let's say it's a handout page, and I numbered them. So let's say, Mr. Urban, may I please have page 14 of the handouts? And I would say, you sure can, and I would get it, and I would hand it to the student, and he or she would say, thank you, Mr. Urban, and I would say, you're welcome. What did we call that? We called it common courtesy. Well, common courtesy is not so common anymore. Let me give you another example. In the 1980s, uh, up to the current time, if you haven't dealt with it, instead of politely raising the hand and say, may I please have, you're going to get, I need, in a very demanding, demeaning, and disrespectful tone of voice. Where do they learn to do that? Sadly, many of them learn to do that at home, and when they say it, they get what they need. I, I want to correct that uh, without coming down hard on the uh, on the kids. Now, in the 1960s and 70s, I developed a, a little technique in correcting problems in the classroom without having to yell at kids, which I did in my first couple years. I'd raise my voice and say, hey, what are you doing back there? Well, I, uh, I, didn't, uh, I decided that wasn't very effective. And so I just told the kids, if you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing, I said, I'm going to go like this. I'm going to call timeout. And if I call timeout and I'm looking at you, it means you are the cause of the timeout. And I said, so we won't have a confrontation and no argument and nobody gets sent to the office or anything like that. I said, if you're the one that's the cause of the timeout, just stop what you're doing, say I'm sorry, I'll say apology, accept it, and we'll move right on with class. Well, that worked about 95% of the time. So I try it again uh, in the 80s after I changed schools. But here's what the problem was. Somebody would do something wrong, I would call time out, and they'd look at me like, huh? Like, what did I do? And they really meant that. They didn't know that they were doing anything wrong. And the problem was, we were losing too much class time because I was calling time out too many times, but not only was I calling time out, I had to explain what was wrong. And I said, oh, I have to deal with this in a different way. This isn't working. Okay, solving the problem. So I drew upon a few things from my past to help me solve the problem. My first year of teaching, I went to an after-school workshop conducted by a legendary teacher in our district on classroom management. And he started it with these words. He said, what you accept, you teach. Okay, I didn't know what he meant, but what he meant was if a, if a child in your presence or in your classroom does something that's rude, mean-spirited, or against the rules, and you don't deal with it, then you have accepted that behavior. And in accepting it, you have taught that student and the other students in his or her presence that that's okay behavior. Okay, and he said, you don't do that. He said, you must deal with it right away. He said, the way you deal with it is very important. He said, but, but you must deal with it. Now, here's another one that means exactly the same thing. What you permit, you promote. And it's the, it's the core to good classroom management. All right, now, the other thing I drew from is I remembered something that my sociology professor said on the first day of sociology. It was the first time I'd ever taken a sociology course. He came out and he said, for those of you who are not sociology majors, how many of you know the number one principle of sociology? Well, none of us did. And he said, well, let me give it to you. And he wrote it on the chalkboard. He says, people behave as they're expected to behave. And I realized, aha, 
my students come into my class now in the early 1980s and they don't know what my expectations are. So I'm going to deal with that and I'm going to deal with the problem in a different way. Okay, another thing that occurred to me that in the 1980s out came this wonderful book by Stephen Covey called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, he says, chapter number one, he says, be proactive. He says, act or be acted upon. Well, every time a kid did something rude in my class, I was being acted upon, and then I was reacting. So I decided, okay, I'm going to take a page from his book. I'm going to be proactive. I'm going to act before they act and see if I can head this off. Now, another one of the chapters in that book is always think win-win. And win-win means we all win. And so this is the way I sold good manners, and the golden rule was the fact that mutual respect always results in a win-win situation. And that's an easy sell. The kids did buy into it. So, making expectations known. I gave a lot of handouts in my career uh, every year, and I numbered them all. This was page number one. It was, it was uh, up at the top, it said, whatever happened to good manners? And it was a whole page about manners along with some discussion questions. And I handed it out on the first day of school right after we talked about the importance of having social skills. And the kids read it. They got involved in a discussion. It took up the whole first period. And what was really interesting to me is that the kids thanked me for doing this. They said, Mr. Urban, uh, so many rude things go on in classes and the teachers don't do anything about it. We wish all of the teachers would do this. And I was so pleased to have them uh, say that. And from that came a wonderful environment uh, in our classroom. I had my students write a mission statement. There's a chapter in the book about mission statement. I had a teacher mission statement, and they had a class mission statement. And one year, one of my classes wrote this as their mission statement. This is a golden rule classroom. We practice what we preach. And then they went up to the art department and they got a great big poster board and they put it on there and they posted it up in the front of my room. So every day you came in my room, you saw this. This is a golden rule classroom. We practice what we preach. And those kids did that too. They were really wonderful to me and they were wonderful to each other. Okay, also still along that line of uh, a girl said, I counted. She said, I always felt welcome, I counted, and everybody was polite. Well, when I got into character education about 17, 18 years ago, one of the phrases that really caught my attention was caring community. Uh, and I thought, that's exactly what I was trying to create in my class, was a caring community, and now I had a name for it. Okay, now, the actual thing that got me into character education was... Uh, Something that happened in a bookstore. I was teaching summer school at the University of San Francisco, and I went down to the bookstore to look over the books, and I see this book entitled Educating for Character, How Our Schools Can Teach Respect and Responsibility. I almost did backflips uh, in the bookstore because I thought, whoa, there's somebody else out there that believes what I do, and he's a brilliant college professor and has written this incredible book, and I no clue who Dr. Thomas Lacona was, but I wrote him a letter and he graciously wrote right back to me and he got me involved and, and, uh, and I went, went from there. But as I say, I was already doing these types of things, but I didn't know there was such a thing as a, char a character education and terms like caring community. <clears throat> okay, one of the things that Tom writes in that book is he says kids need caring attachments to adults and each other. And I think most of us are loving teachers who care a lot about our students and we do a lot to form a good relationship with them. But I think many teachers fall short on getting the kids to uh, care for one another and to know each other and so on. And so I developed a few uh, strategies along that line. I, I, want, I did not want them to be strangers in my class. I did not want them to sit in cliques. Uh, and so let me share with you a couple of things I did. Now, I want to borrow a concept here, an idea from my good friend Michelle Borba. Uh, Michelle, often in her presentations, and I heard her for the first time several years ago, she plays the theme music to the, the program Cheers. You remember Cheers? It was one of our favorite programs. <clears throat> and the, the, the words, the main words to the theme song were, you want to go where everybody knows your name, and they're always glad you came. Well, I wanted a cheers atmosphere without the beer in my classroom. So I developed, over several years, I developed some little strategies that did, in fact, bring that about. 
a cheers atmosphere, a place where everyone knows your name, and a lot more. And I had three things. One is the two-minute interview. If I conducted a two-minute interview with someone that I've never met before, in two minutes I could learn five interesting things about you, and you would learn five interesting things about me. We could do that in two minutes. Okay. So over the years, I developed that. And all of these things, I don't have time to go in and explain. They are all in the book. A personal info sheet. Every kid filled out a personal info sheet, had 40 questions about himself or herself. They loved filling it out. You know why? Because it was all about them. But I learned a lot about them. And they, they thought it was pretty neat that I wanted to know that much information. And they didn't have to answer questions that they didn't want to. The last one says musical chairs. That was the the name my kids gave to my policy of never sitting in the same place with the same people every day. We had a rotating system where you always moved every day. They resisted at first, and then they loved it. They said, You're, we're so glad that you do this because we made a lot of new friends, and we felt like we really came together as a, as a class. OK. Um, I love to tell stories, but in a short amount of time, you can't tell a lot of them. But I do want to give you a brief uh, version of this, which is one of my favorite stories. Uh, it says, a European perception, Henning Ostman. Henning Ostman is the name of a young German exchange student that I had about 15 years ago. And he transferred into my United States history class halfway through the school year. So the kids in the class, they had been with me for a half a year and everything was pretty routine. But he had to change his schedule around and he transferred into my class. And I loved Henning. He was just one of the greatest kids that I ever taught. And he had been in my class for four days. And he came up to me after class one day and he says, you know, Mr. Urban, he had a big smile on his face. And he says, Mr. Urban, he says, you are a very lucky teacher. I wasn't too sure what he meant. And, and I said, Henning, I, I am a lucky teacher. I said, I found my calling early in life. I said, I'm teaching at this school. I, I said, is that what you mean? And he says, oh, no, 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 Mr. Urban. He said, he says, I'll tell you what I mean. And he held up his hands like this. And he said, Mr. Urban, I take six classes at this school. And the students in third period US history are by far the most polite of all of the students in my six classes. He said, Mr. Urban, you are very lucky to have such polite students in third period. <laughs> and I said, Henning, I love the kids in third period. I am lucky to have them. I said, but look here. I said, I teach five classes, and the students in all five of my classes are polite. And he goes, whoa. He says, you are luckier than I thought you were. And then he said that I should get all the teachers up in the multi-use room and teach them how to teach manners to kids. Would love to do it, but would they listen to me? No. The, old, the ancient scriptures say the teacher is without honor in his own land. So I did not try to do that with other teachers. I, I did mentor teacher, though, and I uh, helped some of the young teachers coming in do, uh, do that. <clears throat> OK, number two, what they remember. And I was so happy, and not, but not surprised that a lot of kids remember this because it's something that I really emphasize. I remember to always have something good to say. I want to pay a very brief tribute to one of the greatest colleagues and greatest friends that I ever had. His name was Tim Hansel. Uh, he died about two years ago. He was a colleague of mine. And Tim was what I call a life enhancer. He was a human magnet. Everybody wanted to be around him. And I studied his life and was trying to figure out why, what is it about Tim that's so magical? And I realized that when I asked him about it one day and, you know, about how people are drawn to him, and he said, you know, Hal, I was very lucky. My parents, when I grew up, taught me to be careful of what I say. He said, they said to say good things. And he said, so I have a personal motto. And my personal motto is always have something good to say. And I taught that concept to my kids. And every time I taught it, I was always thinking of Tim uh, when I did that. <clears throat> I wrote a book, it was my second book, and I wrote a book called Positive Words, Powerful Results. Now you notice what the subtitle there says? Simple ways to honor, affirm, and celebrate life. I want to teach kids to use their words to do that instead of hurt people, instead of bring people down. Because it's a serious problem in our society right now. And so I was really glad that a lot of them remembered to always have something good to say. OK, that covers a couple of chapters here. Uh, good teachers protect the atmosphere from toxic words. So if I'm going to get them to say positive things, let's address the negative side first, the toxic words. And so this is what I did. It's very simple. I went up to the chalkboard, and I wrote, choosing an atmosphere. I said, you're going to help me choose an atmosphere that we're going to have in here uh, for the whole year. This is probably the second day of school. And I wrote, on the left side of the board, in, in big letters, I wrote toxic. And on the other side, I wrote nourishing. 
Now, you never teach a lesson when you use new words uh, without the kids understanding what you mean. So I got out the dictionary, and everybody gave their input. So by the time we were done, everybody knew what toxic meant, and everybody knew what nourishing meant. And I said, well, which kind of atmosphere do you want to have? Uh, they all wanted a nourishing atmosphere and not a toxic one. I said, OK, so let's make sure we get the toxins out and get the nourishment in. OK, so I go back to the word toxic. And I said, and then I bring out my first visible reminder of the year. I pull out a Lysol can that has been doctored a little bit. A white piece of paper was cut around it. The skull and crossbones was on it. It said poison. Now, this Lysol can was empty. Make sure you understand I said empty, because I've had teachers hear me and not hear the whole thing, and then they go out and spray kids with Lysol. Do not do, not do that in my name. I, this can was empty. It was just a symbol. And if some kid sprayed poison in the atmosphere of my class, I would pick it up, and we'd make kind of a joke. I, I said, whoops, whoops, we've had a little leakage here, a little seepage. I said, let's get the toxins out of the out of the classroom. So it was pretty effective. And uh, they didn't want to be the cause of me holding that sign up. OK, now, this is another important concept. I gave the students a big voice uh, in what we did and what we did not do, including writing the rules, which came in the second week of school. But we're choosing an atmosphere. And I said, OK, if you don't want to have a toxic atmosphere, then you tell me what you do not want to hear. I, I didn't want to tell them, here's six or seven or 10 things that I don't want to hear in this room. I want them to tell me what they don't want to hear. OK, so I, this is the way the, the chalkboard looked. On one side, it was toxic. On the other side, it was nourishing. And, I, and they gave me, we did toxic first, they gave me the things that they did not want to hear. OK, now, most classes that I taught, they gave me six, seven, eight things. The, in the class of 1998, I don't know why. These kids were really special. They just really loved this assignment. And they got into it in their small groups. And they came up with 30 things that they considered toxic. They did not want to hear anybody say in class. So we gave them a nickname. We called them the Dirty 30. Keep them out of the classroom, the hallways, and off the campus. And believe me, a school can do this. And it's amazing what a difference it makes in the, uh, in the atmosphere. OK, now, I use a lot of visible reminders, so let me show you how I reminded them not to spray poison in the atmosphere of the classroom other than my can. Uh, my classroom was a rectangle, and over on this wall was the clock. It was up about this high. And the next day they came in, there were six signs around the clock. Here are the six signs. No complaining. Do you know that that's the number one way students uh, poison the atmosphere of a classroom? Do you know it's the number one way that teachers poison the atmosphere of a classroom? OK, now what always accompanies complaining? Whining, yes. OK, and then the twin cousins of whining are moaning and groaning. So they saw all of these up on the clock. You know that by the time a kid is in the third grade, he or she can complain, whine, moan, and groan all in the same sentence. It's because they've been doing it. They're in the habit of doing it. OK, another one is put downs. I mentioned earlier, this is a huge problem in our society today. Uh, swearing, I make it very specific what is swearing and what is not swearing, and uh, the ever popular gossip. And the kids were really, really good at honoring these things in my class because they had a choice on these things, and these were things that they wrote down that they said they weren't going to do. Now, I want to give you just a very brief example of changing something from toxic to nourishing and to do it in good humor uh, so you can make your point with the kids. All right. Have any of you who have been classroom teachers, have you ever heard kids utter these two short words? OK, they usually come at the end of an announcement that a test or something is coming, right? But it, did, it comes out more like this, doesn't it? Oh, no. And it's toxic. OK, that's toxic. Those kinds of sounds are toxic. So I want to give you an example of what I did. Now, I was a high school teacher, and I mentioned before, I think I gave a lot of handouts. Well, high school kids, are, they have a conditioned response to handouts. A handout is coming. It's still in my hand. What is it that they're thinking that handout means? Yeah, they're going to have to do something. They might have to read. They might have to write. They might have to work. And worst of all, they might have to think. OK, and so. It always happened. The first time I ever gave a handout, I, I've st it's still in my hand. And the first kid, he goes, 
oh, no. And I held up my can, and I said, now, it's okay. It's early in the year. I said, but we've had a little seepage here. I said, now, we're going to correct this. I said, remember, you said you didn't want a toxic atmosphere. That's toxic. We're going to have a nourishing atmosphere. So I said, uh, what, what I did was that I made a big sales pitch on how good my handouts were, better than textbooks. Anything's better than a textbook anyway, right? Okay, so I said, make the statement nourishing. I said, now my handouts are good. I said, this is if you want to nourish the atmosphere, you, you get the first handout and you go like this. Oh boy, this looks like it'll be a wonderful learning opportunity. Well, they love saying that. They got a kick out of it and so that's what they did and they came up with all kinds of other versions uh, of it. Okay, now the other side of the chalkboard. Good teachers nourish the atmosphere with kind and affirming words. Nourishing. Okay. Uh, we're going to do uh, the other side. Nourishing. What do you want to hear? What are the types of things you want to hear from your classmates? Okay. We go back to that list again. We've already done the left side. Class of 1998, they came up with 30. So I'm going to stick with them. They came up with 30 more on the other side. As I say, most classes don't do that. We call them the thoughtful 30. Teach them, use them, get the staff to use them and get the kids to use them. Unbelievable what a difference you can make, whether it's just in your own classroom or on the campus uh, as a whole. Okay, here's a little another example of nourishment. The kids had a lot of fun saying this. I told them every day, I would ask them, how do you come to class today? And I said, the answer I want to hear is thirsting for knowledge, Mr. Urban. They thought that was so much fun to say. And so they did, and if, if I asked them every day for 20 days in a row, I have per now programmed them. They say, thirsting for knowledge, Mr. Urban, or hungry to learn, Mr. Urban. Well, if they start saying everything like this for 20 days in a row, I'm using a little technique called neuro-linguistic programming. I programmed that into the atmosphere of the class, and they had a lot of fun with it. It may seem silly or even stupid, but it worked, and it did nourish the atmosphere of the class. Okay, here's, uh, somebody tell me, please, I wasn't looking at my watch. How much time? 10 minutes. Okay, thank you, Joe. Okay. Number three, I remember to celebrate today every day. Okay, now, lesson nine in the book, uh, good teachers start every class with something positive. So this is another way of nourishing. Uh, I would greet them at the door. I would take attendance, which took only a few seconds. And then I would point to a sign which was above my head. That's what it said. If you're wondering how big my signs were, most of them were the size of a piece of paper. And that was right above my head. And I would say to them, what are we celebrating today? Well, they had four choices. This evolved over several years. And, and I also devised ways to get, it was voluntary, but I got every kid in every class involved in it. They had four choices. They could share good news. And they love sharing their good news. They can complete this sentence, I'm thankful for. It could be a person, it could be a thing, it could be an intangible. Okay, kind words. Kind words means you say something kind and affirming about somebody else in the class, but it cannot be about something physical. In other words, it's not about hair and clothing and looks and jewelry and that kind of stuff. No, it's about a characteristic or a quality that you admire and or appreciate in that other person. Now, I do entire presentations just on this concept, teaching kids to use positive language instead of negative, hurtful uh, language. And they're a little slow. At the beginning of the year, they don't do well at this, but they get better. And that's one of the proudest things I ever was of my students is how good they got at affirming one another, building each other up instead of tearing each other down. And then the last one is funny things. They could say or do something funny that makes the rest of us laugh. Two restrictions. Number one, it cannot be dirty. And number two, it cannot be mean-spirited. But we had a lot of fun with that, and I'll, I'll share uh, some of it with you uh, at the end here. Okay, number four, uh, I remember that I make important choices every day of my life. Now, when I got to that, I realized I could not do that. I can't even do all of choices in 40 minutes, let alone in a, in a, a keynote address. And so, I'm doing a breakout session on Friday on what I taught kids about choices, so I'm going to skip that one uh, for today. The, the chapter uh, in, in my book says, Good Teachers Help Their Students Discover the Power of Choice. Uh, I should tell you that I'm a product of a Jesuit education. If you know anything about the Jesuits, they teach that the greatest gift that you ever got 
uh, is, um, from God is your free will, the ability to make choices. And I took that to heart. And I am aware that we make choices every minute of every day. Okay. Um, one of the reasons that the choice thing became big is because in my first book, Life's Greatest Lessons, um, 20 Things That Matter, the original title of this book was 20 Things I Want My Kids to Know, Passing On Life's Greatest Lessons. It was a letter to my children. And it was saying, this is what I want you to know about life. And I was self-published for a long time. And then Simon & Schuster bought the book from me. But so many adults and corporations were buying the book that they didn't want kids anywhere on the title. Uh, I resisted, but I gave in. So they took kids off the title. And it's now called Life's Greatest Lessons, 20 Things That Matter. But it will always, to me, be 20 things I want my kids to know. And my kids were my, my children at home and my students at school. OK. <clears throat> Number five, I remember the difference between a wish and a goal. I would say over the many, many years that I've taught, more kids have written to me or uh, talked to me over the phone about teaching them to set goals. Uh, chapter 18, which is the longest chapter in the book, says good teachers help their students set lifetime goals. And I can't do justice to it in a few minutes, but I'll just give you some basics. This was the first assignment I gave them, and I gave them two days to do this on their own. What are 10 things you'd like to achieve in your lifetime, and which one is the most important? They struggled with that assignment. Many of them could not come up with 10, and many of them came up with things that weren't even near being a goal, to be happy, to be rich, and so on. They're vague, vague things. And so I said, OK, we've got some work to do. I want to teach you about about goal setting. And by the way, I believe that we should start teaching kids to set goals in elementary school, that they should be reinforced in junior high, reinforced in high school, and they should come to college with a, with a set of written goals. There are a number of college professors that would support me on that because of the dropout rate of college kids in the first year. They don't have focus. OK, I, I use quotations a lot. There's a chapter in the book about that. The purpose of goals is to focus our attention. The mind will not reach toward achievement until it has clear objectives. The magic begins when we set goals. It is then that the switch is turned on, the current begins to flow, and the power to accomplish becomes reality. Wynn Davis was a psychology professor at Ohio State University until a few years ago. OK, the final assignment. Now, in the meantime, I taught them a whole bunch of things about goal setting. And they started getting into it. In the final assignment, I says, what are 100 things you'd like to achieve in your lifetime? They had a ball doing this. And they got so excited. And some of them wrote way more than 100. And that's the thing I get the feedback on. They tell me, Mr. Urban, I've, I've checked off a whole bunch of my goals. I'm adding more goals. And, and uh, so that's something that I highly, highly recommend that uh, we do. OK, now I'm giving you number six because I skipped number four. And we're going to close with this. I remember your sense of humor, that we laughed a lot, and there is such a thing as good, clean humor. All right, chapter 17 in the book, good teachers laugh with their students. Laughter is one of the healthiest things for us uh, in our entire lifetime. All right, now, I have a favorite type of humor. And I have been collecting these things for years and years and years. I call it unintended and unexpected humor. The person who comes up with something funny, whether it's something that he or she said, is not trying to be funny, but it comes out funny. The little boy wrote, and he said, I don't know what you did with Miss Janae, but she sure came back in a good mood. He was not trying to be funny, but you all laughed at it, right? OK, well, let me give you a couple of examples. This first one happened when I was student teaching at Washington High School here in San Francisco in 1965. I was a US history guy, you know, and I just completed what I thought was a really good job of, of teaching about Abraham Lincoln, the greatness of him, and the Civil War. OK, and this is the question. OK, now I'll bet everybody in the room knows the answer to that question, right? Two long words, okay, the Emancipation Proclamation, you remember that? OK, but that's a, that's a mouthful for kids. This kid was not trying to be funny. This is his answer. <laughs> OK, that's a keeper. OK, I also taught world history many times. What was Ferdinand Magellan's most significant achievement during the age of exploration? Now, most people that answer that question, they go like this. Why do they go like that? Because he was a leader of the first expedition to circumnavigate the globe means go all the way around. OK, you can see what's coming, can't you? First person to circumcise the world. OK, 
Okay, by the way, both of those kids, I gave them credit. Okay, <laughs> they were close enough. They got the right idea. Okay, have any of you, any of you old enough to remember the old movie marquees? Remember those red block letters that they put up by hand? Well, there was a church that I passed every day between my home and school. And the pastor had this marquee out by the road. And he changed the message every week, and it always rhymed. And it was, they were always kind of cute. They didn't make me laugh out loud, but they brought a smile to my face. He says, if you're tired of sin, come on in. And it was there all week. But when I came in on Friday, somebody had gotten in that box. And they changed the sign a little bit with the letters. And this is what it said the next day. <laughs> Boy, that, that phone number must have got a lot of calls, I'll tell you. Okay. Uh, here's another one. I was looking for a dog for me and my kids. Eats anything, loves children. That is one dog I did not get. But that was an actual one ad. Okay. Church bulletin, they are full of them. You could fill a book on things from the church bulletin. Little Mother's Club meets Tuesday night. Any woman in the church interested in becoming a little mother should see the pastor in his study. <laughs> Somebody needs to be more careful in writing church bulletin notices. Okay, here's the last one, and this is my favorite of all time. I gave what I consider to be one of my best assignments ever. It was called an affirmation assignment. I'm teaching kids to build people up instead of tear kids down. And so I gave them an assignment, it was called a verbal affirmation assignment, use your words to make someone feel good. It had three sections on it. You were to pick three people. You put the person's name, you put your relationship to that person, you put what you said, and then underneath of it you put what the response was. And the kids loved this assignment because they made other people feel so good. And it, obviously it had to be sincere. Okay, affirmation assignment, the first part of it says, what did you say? Now, I had a wonderful student in the year 1999-2000. Uh, His name was Tyrone, and I loved Tyrone. He was naturally funny, but he was not trying to be funny on this assignment. He was a good student. He took it serious. Affirmation assignment, what did you say? This is Tyrone's answer. I didn't say anything. My lips did all the work. <laughs> okay. So then it says affirmation assignment. What was the response? Here's what he wrote down. Hers were doing the same. I, I said to Tyrone, you know, I had a lot of fun with him. I said, Tyrone, I can't give you points for that because it wasn't verbal. It says, use your words, not your lips. And, um, and, and I pointed on the assignment. It says, see here? It says, use your words. And then down at the bottom of the instructions, it says, make someone feel good. And Tyrone didn't miss a beat. He put his finger on there and he says, Mr. Urban, the point of the assignment was to make somebody feel good. I made Serena feel good. <laughs> okay. All right. The Two favorite words of every audience and program director. In conclusion, I just want to share uh, three quick things with you. Uh, about 2,500 years ago, one of the wisest persons that ever lived said, educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. And just two years ago, the Secretary of Education said, education at its best should expand the mind and build character. Now, there are a lot of wonderful definitions of character education. I want to close with my definition that I've used for many, many years, and I felt it was my mission in teaching. Character education is bringing out the best in our kids. <clears throat> I hope you have a wonderful time in San Francisco, but I also hope you take full advantage of this wonderful conference and that you go back to your home and your school and your building or whatever, wherever it is that you work, and that you will go back with some new skills to bring out the best in kids. God bless you for what you do. Thank you very much. You know, this is my sixth conference uh, since I've been working at CEP, our sixth National Forum on Character Education, but Hal probably doesn't remember this. The first CEP National Forum on Character Education I went to was in Houston, Texas, where I was in the audience, uh, like many of you, and I went to Hal's session. And I remember vividly shaking his hand at the door when I went in. So he not only talks the talk, he walks the walk. And incidentally, I adopted that nugget myself. Hell, you probably don't know that. And, and took it back um, to where I was at that time in my life. And um, Hell, you're a great American. Um, you're a great educator. You're a career educator. You've made a difference. 
thanks for being who you are. Thank you for being here. Thank you for kicking off this national forum with dignity and with a very powerful, relevant message laced full of golden nuggets. And I saw people writing notes feverishly that are going to take those things back and, and make a difference in their own classrooms. Okay. Please accept this thank small you, token John. of our appreciation. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you.